We've got, come on now, come on in here. I'm looking for names. I'm looking for cities. <clears throat> um, come on in, get comfortable. We'll give everybody else a couple minutes to, to join the webinar, but I'm, I'm looking to see where else others are from. And uh, there we go. Thank you, Brink. Another Florida person. Here we go. They're rolling in now. We've got Puerto Rico, New Mexico, California, Seattle, Dallas, Texas, LA. This is great. Keep them coming. As you come on in, say hi to us in the chat. Italy, there we go. Now we got some international folks rocking with us. Um, come on in, say hi in the chat, tell us what city you're joining us from and we will get started in just another minute or so once we uh, see the participant count slow down. So hi Philly, hi LA, Boston, um, come on in and say hi, tell us where you're joining us from. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think I see the participant count slowing down. So um, so we're gonna go ahead and actually get started. All right, so uh, hi everybody. My name is Serona Elton. I'm the head of educational partnerships here at the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the MLC. Welcome, welcome to our webinar. Um, I'd actually like to introduce to you my colleague and our CEO, Chris Arend. Go ahead, Chris, say hi to everybody. Oh, you're on mute, Chris. First time this week, but it wouldn't be a week if I didn't <laughs> blow the mute button. Uh, hey, everybody, I'm Chris. Good to see you. Great to be here with all of you today. And of course, with Serona, uh, my dear colleague and friend. Awesome. Um, so yeah, go ahead and tell us so, what we're here for. <laughs> yeah, and I see a couple more folks uh, joining and uh, great to see uh, Prempa from South Africa as well. That's fantastic. So this webinar is geared towards self-administered songwriters, um, songwriters that uh, for at least some of their works act as their own publishers. If you are not a self-administered songwriter, you are more than welcome to stay, uh, but know that we are offering different webinars for different types of members, and there may be some others more that are more relevant to you. So before you um, spend an hour with us, I wanna make sure that you uh, feel like this is a good use of your time. We know time is precious. Um, and again, we're going to gear this toward self-administered songwriters. Uh, if you want to know more about our other uh, webinars, you can check out our resources page where we list all of the webinars that are upcoming. Um, as Serona said, I'm the CEO of the Mechanical Licensing Collective. Uh, I, uh, I have been with the company since a year ago, January, and um, was actually just downtown in Nashville, Tennessee, where I'm based checking out our uh, office, which will be done in probably a month or so. And uh, it was really exciting to get up, to get back out in the world for the first time and seemingly forever. So I hope um, many of you are uh, also starting to get back in the world. Hopefully you're all well. Um, lots of vaccine out there. If you're inclined, I'd certainly encourage it. And, um, and hopefully this means that we'll be able to do this in person um, sometime soon for at least those of you that have the chance to get to Nashville. But as you can see, the advantage to Zoom is we can meet with so many of you from so many parts of the world. We know in the, um, I think it's almost 175 webinars we've done since last spring that we have had attendees from every state in this country and folks from more than 50 countries around the world. So um, for those of you from distant places, know that we're gonna keep doing this so that we can always connect with you wherever you are and you don't have to fly around the world just to speak with us. Serona, back to you. Sure, sure. So let me let everybody know how this is going to work because it's a little different than a, a lot of our regular webinars. So what we're going to do is first, Chris and I are going to cover off some common questions that we typically get. And then we're going to use this really cool tool called Thought Exchange thought exchange. And what it does is it enables us to facilitate a Q&A session where we can crowdsource our questions um, from you, crowdsource the questions, and then you get to rate those questions. And that's going to let us know which questions are the most important to the group, right? So it's crowdsourcing, and then you guys are rating, and that's going to help us decide which questions to tackle in which order. And so as we are, as, as Chris and I are going <coughs> to give you the answers to some of the most common questions, start thinking now about what questions you might like to ask when we invite you to do that in thought 
exchange, um, start thinking about those questions, which you, you may already have them. That's maybe why you're here already. Um, so uh, we're really excited. It's a really cool tool and, um, and we, love, uh, we love using it for these special webinars. All right, so Chris, why don't we just jump in to um, some of those frequently asked questions. Um, so, and by the way, um, we're joined today also by my colleague, Lacey. You'll get to hear from her a bit later. And um, you know, generally a group of people we like to refer to as our webinar queens because they keep it all working in the background so that Chris and I, you know, we get the easy part, they, they keep it all functioning. So, um, so thanks to our webinar queens and especially thanks to Lacey for sharing that today. Um, so why don't you, Chris, start with talking about what we, what the MLC does. Yes. And um, if you've joined us on another webinar, you've no doubt heard this before, but it, it always feels important and worthwhile for us to go over it again, because one of the biggest challenges you have as a self-administered songwriter, and many of you are also self-distributed um, performers who own your own sound recordings, is, is you've got a lot of different revenue streams that you've got to keep track of. Basically, there are a lot of different ways you can be paid. And we always wanna make sure that you understand which revenue stream we're managing, and then some of the others that are important for you as well, so that you don't ever get confused between those. Because the bottom line is you work hard, you create great works, and you deserve to be paid in all the different ways you can be paid as a creator. And we are only one of the ways that you can get paid. So what the MLC does, we have established and are maintaining a public database of musical works ownership information. Hopefully all of you have checked out the database. If you go to our home page, on the top right of the screen, you'll see a yellow button that says public search. If you click on that, you can instantly um, search on any work in our database and see who's registered shares, who hasn't. Um, your friends can do this, your family can do this. You can do this for songwriters you know, some of your favorite songwriters of all time. Um, if there's a song in our database, you can find the information there and see exactly what the status of it is. Um, we are then administering a new blanket license, a license available to digital audio services for their US operations. Essentially, those services can now secure a license to use any song in the world on their US services. But in exchange for that license, they've got to send the MLC a whole lot of data and, of course, the royalties that are due um, under the law. And then we, in turn, take all of the data that they send us and all of the data that we have in our database increasingly data that's driven directly by you through your registrations and your submissions. And we match the sound recordings to the musical works. And by making that match or that connection, we now know who to pay royalties to for the use of those songs. So we then collect and distribute the digital audio mechanical royalties to you as self-administered songwriters, but also to your peers who may be published songwriters through their music publishers to folks who have administrators, we pay their administrators. And for those of you outside the US, and we know a handful of you are, we also pay your local society, mechanical rights society, if you're affiliated with them. Um, you don't always have to be affiliated with that local society, but if you are, that's probably a really easy way for you to get connected to this royalty stream um, through them because they're already collecting for you around the world. We now have more than 50 foreign CMOs um, who are members of the MLC, and they represent um, rights holders in almost 100 countries. I believe it's 97 countries. So we are sending out royalties already um, to organizations around the world, and that is leading to um, payouts, or will lead to payouts to rights holders um, and songwriters in, in almost 100 countries. So Serona, now would you go over the handful of things that we do not do so that folks understand that for those other streams of revenue, um, you wanna make sure that you also have a way to get connected to those because we don't want you to leave any money on the table. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so one of the things that we do not do is we do not administer performance rights for musical works or collect performance royalties. So what that means is you as a writer need to make sure you are affiliated with a performing rights organization. There's several in the US, every country pretty much has at least one. Um, and so like ASCAP, BMI, you know, there's a lot of them around the world. Make sure you're affiliated with a performing rights organization so you can collect your performance royalties. 
Um, we are not involved in administering digital performance rights for sound recordings or collecting digital performance royalties. And so in the United States, that's something that Sound Exchange does. Um, they collect those royalties that are related to the use of a sound recording, and then they pay artists and they pay sound recording copyright owners, which are often the record label or, or the artist if they're self-released. And so if you happen to also be an artist, make sure you are signed up with Sound Exchange so that you do not miss out on those royalties. Um, we are not involved in administering mechanical rights or royalties for physical products. So um, if a record company is releasing a CD record or a vinyl record into the marketplace, um, they usually need a mechanical license. And that is not something that the MLC is involved with. And so if your musical works are being used in that way, you're going to want to make sure that you're not missing out on those royalties. Um, we do not administer any licenses or collect any royalties for the use of audiovisual products with musical works. In other words, video, <clears throat> video. We are not involved in video. You know, there's some really popular video platforms out there. Um, and so you're going to want to make sure that you have something in place to collect those, those video royalties for the musical work and for the sound recording, if you're the sound recording owner as well. Um, and as Chris mentioned, you know, we are collecting from the U.S. operations for these digital services, not outside the United States. And so if your musical works are in recordings that are then being streamed and downloaded outside of the United States, States, you're going to want to make sure that you have some sort of solution in place in, you know, in your overall business uh, approach to make sure you're not missing out on those royalties as well. Okay, Chris, so um, let me see here. Now, I think at this point, we're going to pivot to a particular set of frequently asked questions. We're going to run through these because, you know, we've done a bunch of these webinars, as Chris mentioned earlier, and we know what a lot of the questions are people have coming in. Now, we're going to answer these four right here, right? And if you think of more, be, be thinking of those because our thought exchange um, activity in a few minutes is going to give you the opportunity to ask those additional questions. Okay, so I'll tackle the first one or two. So which DSPs is the MLC collecting from? So only certain types of digital services are required to secure mechanical licenses and pay mechanical royalties. Um, DSPs, digital service providers, that's what DSP stands for, DSPs, which operate a service in the United States that offers audio only interactive streaming or downloads are eligible to obtain blanket mechanical licenses established by the MMA, Music Modernization Act. DSPs operating under the blanket license will be required to pay the mechanical royalties due under that license to the MLC. All right, question number two, when does the MLC collect and pay royalties? So digital services, DSPs, will submit sound recording usage data and accompanying mechanical royalties to the MLC on a monthly basis, monthly basis. The MLC will then match that usage data to the musical works data in our database. Once it's matched, we then pay out those mechanical royalties to our members each month. Um, you can find out more about the information, uh, sorry, more information about the payment timeline on a particular page on our website. And I know our webinar queens will post that in the chat. Um, you should know that generally if the activity is happening, let's say the activity happened in January. Um, if you go to the end of January and then you add 75 days, that's generally how long it takes for that activity and that money to make its way from the digital service into the, to the MLC and into your royalty statement. And so, um, some of you got paid in our very first distribution in mid-April. That was for January activity. Um, and so when you go to that web page, you'll see that there is this, this particular processing time that's involved. Um, but we do that every month. So you will be getting royalty statements from us monthly. All right, Chris, over to you for the next one. Sure. So a uh, really important question. How can I be sure my works are accurately represented in the MLC's database? The simple answer is check your data. Um, and we've been talking about this since last year um, when we first established the database. And it's a really important step that every writer can take. And quite frankly, every writer can take it, not just self-administered writers like those of you who are self-administered, but even if you're a published writer. Something I say often is the person who is probably in the best position to know whether their data is accurate 
is the person who wrote the song. So if you wrote the song, you probably know better than almost anyone what the answers to those key data questions are. And you can quickly check and know whether it's right or wrong. One of the challenges that the industry has had for decades is that data has been held largely behind the scenes in proprietary databases where the folks who benefit from that data, the people getting paid, don't get to see the data. Um, we could not overnight magically create a database that's perfect. So what we've done is we have assembled a really large database, tried to make it easy for rights holders to, to submit changes, um, new registrations, and then most importantly, made all that data public. So again, you don't have to wait till you get a statement from us to know whether you got paid for work. You can go to the database today. I often suggest, even if you remember, go to the public search first, because that way you can see everything that's registered. If your work isn't registered, you may not see that in the portal where you're only seeing the works that you've registered properly, but go in the public search and look up your songs. And if your song is not in our database at all, then you can be sure that we're not able to pay you because we don't have the data to be able to pay you. Um, in the portal, you can search for the works of yours that have been registered. You can also amend those existing works if there are issues with some of the data that you need to correct or update. And you can also then submit new works registrations. So the portal is where you change your data or add new data. Um, the public search is a great place to look to see what you need to do first. There is also a bulk, a bulk upload feature in the portal. It's essentially a way for you to put data into an Excel file that you can then upload and it pre-populates the new registration submission forms in our portal. That can be useful if you've got a bunch of works that you need to register and you wanna do them all at one time and you already have your data in Excel. Um, so that's something else to think about. And then lastly, we have a great initiative called the Data Quality Initiative that allows you to compare your data with ours if you have um, one of the two key identifiers that we use to make that comparison. The first identifier is an ISWC code. Think of that as a social security number for your song. It's a unique identifier that when assigned to a song uh, only correlates with that particular song. And if you have that in your records, we have that in ours. We can use that to then compare your data with ours um, for that song. And if you have a song code, we call it an MLC song code, which is a unique identifier we assign, you can also do that. But the ISWC may be the more common of the two. So if you wanna check out more about the data quality initiative, you can go to our website. I think Lacey will post the link in our chat. Fourth question, what is the connection between the MLC and Harry Fox and how does that affect my works registrations? So as I mentioned, the MLC had to establish a database very quickly rather than starting from scratch, which we wouldn't have been able to do in the very short time we had. Literally, we had 18 months from the time we were selected to be the MLC and January 1, we had to build everything. Um, we did a deal with a vendor, in this case, Harry Fox, and part of that deal allowed us to access and essentially um, uh, copy all of their data um, to use as a starting point for our database. So the starting point for our data was the HFA database. Since we have launched um, the public aspects of our portal, we have seen uh, well over a million new registrations submitted. So our data today is, is growing and significantly larger than where we started. And um, all of that data is now again visible for you as members to review and then to update as and if needed. We know that um, no database that existed was perfect. We asked uh, companies that were interested in being our vendor to submit proposals to us. Um, more than a dozen started that process. Um, at the end of the day, we winded it down to a handful. Harry Fox was chosen. So um, that's where we started. And again, it's through your um, participation by playing your part and checking your data that we will make our data now better for your benefit. That's the goal, right? We wanna make sure we pay you accurately. So if you check your data, you make sure that it's accurate, that should put us in a great position to pay you all the mechanicals that you're due. All right, so those are four questions that we get a lot and hopefully that was helpful to those of you that may have had those questions. Now we're gonna transition into the thought exchange part of this. And this is your opportunity to ask a handful of questions to us. Now. The way the, th the thought exchange works best is if you can submit between one and three questions and then review a bunch of other questions and rate those, we'll get the benefit of all 60 of you now, all of your questions, and then you'll rate those. And that way we can get to the questions that most of you think are most important. 
We inevitably won't get to all the questions, though often we do get through them all. If we don't get to your question, please contact our support team. We've got more than 20 MLC employees that work on our support team. They are dedicated support, ready to speak to you or email with you one-on-one. -on -one. They're available 12 hours a day, Monday through Friday, 8 central in the morning to 8 p.m. Um, Emily, that makes me happy every time I see it. I think so too. Our support team rocks. Um, and they're also available Saturday, nine hours a day. We have invested a lot of time and, and effort into training that team and making them available a lot so that you can always reach them. So please take advantage of support. So as we go into the thought exchange, again, we're gonna ask you to um, submit one to three questions, then rate as many questions as you can, then come back and we will go through those questions. This is a fully confidential process. We will not know who submits which questions. Your name will not be attached unless you type it in your question. So please know these are anonymous questions. Anything at all you're wondering about the MLC, you can ask it and we will try to answer as many questions as we can now. And if we can't, we'll get the rest later. Danny, I saw one that I'm gonna answer now just because it's a great question. What percentage do we take for admin? The answer is a big fat whopping zero. One of the things that you all helped to accomplish when the MMA was passed was a part of the law that says that the digital services have to pay 100% of our operating costs. So we do not deduct a dime, a penny, a fraction of a penny from any of the royalties we collect. Everything we receive gets paid out to you. Okay, um, I see other questions popping in the chat. So again, I'm gonna ask you to hold off on doing those, put them in the thought exchange. Um, the way you do this, Lacey, are you gonna jump in to explain the process? Yes, um, hopefully right. you guys can hear me and um, see the screen. So um, you will see a few options um, of how you can access the Thought Exchange. The first, um, hopefully easiest, is uh, grab your smartphone and you'll open up the camera and just um, hover over the screen over that QR code and a link should pop up um, that you click. Um, and it will take you to the link. Another way that you could join is, is go to tejoin.com and it will um, ask you to put in this um, nine digit code um, so you can access the exchange that way. Or I um, am going to post the um, link in the chat. So it's come into the chat right now. You can click on that hyperlink and access the exchange. So this again is where you will put all of your questions. You'll be first prompted um, to enter your thoughts. Um, again, it is confidential, like Chris said. Um, so you will enter your thoughts. Um, one to three questions um, as a self-administered songwriter that you'd like us to cover on today's webinar. And we're going to do this quickly, five minutes, and that will allow us to then hop back. We're going to highlight a couple of pages on our website that might be of interest that have good information, and then we're going to get right into it and try to get through your questions. So again, uh, if you could go ahead now, go to Thought Exchange, and we can see the participant count there is growing. Uh, put in one to three thoughts and then rate some others, and then we'll come right back and answer the questions. Again, this is fully anonymous. We do not know anything about you when you go into that platform other than that you use the code for today's webinar. Um, so you can ask us anything, and um, we will then get uh, into the questions um, as soon as you're done. While you're doing that, um, <clears throat> and we will try not to distract you too much, um, uh, I guess, uh, no, I'm going to let you, uh, we'll take a minute. We're going to be a little quiet, so we'll take a break. We'll uh, shut our video off. So you're not missing anything and I'll let you focus on asking a few questions. All right, we'll we need, be back we in a couple some, minutes. We need some uh, game show music to play in the background. Like, <laughs> doo, doo, doo. okay, all right, I'm going off camera. We'll be, we'll be letting you focus on questions. Uh, and if you can't access uh, any of this, you can still um, listen and hear all the questions. So again, don't feel like you have to do this. You can sit back, let everyone else do the work and, um, and just um, appreciate uh, hearing the answers to the questions, no doubt. Um, some of the questions you have will be asked by other people. All right, we'll see you in a minute.
Great, it looks like we have 27 participants thus far. We have about 17 questions and it looks like um, you guys have, some of you guys have discovered the rating portion. So again, take um, another 30 seconds or so to enter your question. And once you have finished answering your question, or once you've finished submitting your question, excuse me, you will then move on to that rating portion. And this is where you'll see everyone else's questions. You have a chance to rate them. Maybe someone else had a really great question that you had forgotten about that's really important to you. This is your opportunity to kind of push it up in the rankings. And that way we can see um, what topics and what questions are really important to the group as a whole. Um, you can also um, see on the screen how things are starting to connect. Um, and we see obviously there's 81 ratings. Um, so we will get um, to know what's really important to the group. So we'll give you another um, little over a minute and a half of, of silence and um, uh, continue to, to rate those thoughts. All right, we're getting close to the end. I don't know if this will come through, but I found my sound effects uh, app. Hearing the clock? I heard a little bit, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> I love it. There we go, I can hear that. We need, we're gonna come up with sound effects for next time. <clears throat> we will uh, for sure. <laughs> let's see what else we got. My mind keeps playing the Jeopardy music, but they would not appreciate us using that. But that's like what no, plays in my brain whenever like something like this happens. My brain goes straight to that Jeopardy kind of final Jeopardy round. Here's the question. I just All right, <laughs> we've hit a minute. All right, we've hit the end of the time. So we're gonna say wrap up your last few. I'm gonna... Uh... <laughs> there end. we have it. All right. Well done. And... Uh... And excellent. So we've got um, about half of the folks on the webinar have submitted thoughts and we rated a bunch. So um, with luck, we'll get through all of them, certainly try to make a big dent in them. So Sirona, you're, um, while we take a moment to have, um, to give Lacey a time to compile all that, or at least to um, manage the system that is doing that automatically, um, you wanna take just a couple minutes to highlight some pages um, on the website that are of use for uh, our self-administered songwriters? Absolutely, my pleasure. Okay, so let me share my screen. There we go. All right, so this is our website, right? TheMLC.com. And I wanna show you around a couple of things that might be helpful. So first, let's take a look under the resources section of the site. Um, and if you scroll down, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of resources, um, some of them targeted at our different audiences. So there's a whole section for self-administered songwriters. This is where you find out about webinars that are coming. We've made some uh, helpful videos about things. Um, and one of my favorite things is this digital music royalties um, page. Um, you know, earlier we were speaking about how uh, songwriters and, and publishers need to understand the whole landscape so they don't leave any money on the table anywhere. Um, you know, where does the MLC fit into that? And so there's a diagram on this page that you can take some time with that helps you understand um, how all the different revenues related to digital music royalties flow ultimately to the, to the publishers and the creators um, and the artists and the record companies and all of that. So, so take some time to um, check out that slide. Um, I also want to show you about the how it works section on the website. 
So under how it works, you see um, a diagram that kind of gives you a high level flow of how all these different things come together, how, you know, you can connect to collect, become a member, play your part, which is get your data in great shape, how we bring in usage uh, information and royalties from digital services. We match it all up and we pay people. Um, so really important to check out that diagram as well. But one of the things I want to highlight to you is this sub menu. So under how it works, you see a bunch of different choices here, right? So we talked about the DQI, the DQI. Um, you should explore all of these, but the blanket royalties page um, talks about that timeline, when the usage happens and when you can expect it on a royalty statement. There's a, a diagram there you might find really helpful. Um, there's also information about our historical unmatched royalties. Um, so check out that page as well and our dispute policy. <clears throat> um, so lots of great information under the how it works section. Um, another thing I want to show you, you know, is we have an amazing customer experience team. Some of you already gave them a big shout out in the chat. There's a couple different ways you can reach them depending on what works best for you. Um, so one way is by filling out our help form, um, which is, you know, sort of like sending an email, if you will, it just comes in through a particular queue. So um, you can fill out um, this help form. We also have a phone number that you can call. And when you are logged into the portal, there's also an option to start a chat. Um, and so our support team is available 12 hours a day, um, Monday through Friday, and then another, I think it's nine hours on Saturdays. That's something we're extra proud of. And so lots of different ways to reach out for help. If you just have questions that, you know, could range from, you know, what is the MLC and do I need to become a member, you know, to uh, password resets to I'm trying to register a work and I'm struggling with how to do something. Um, they're really there to help with all kinds of questions. Um, so, so those are some of the resources on our site. Um, Lacey, how are we that doing? Form, yeah. Just yes. to know when you fill out that form, we then get back to you via email. So that's right. the way that you access the email support. And again, 12 hours a day, Monday through Friday, nine hours on Saturday. Um, there, there are only a handful of places in the world where that requires you to wake up in the middle of the night. Um, but for most folks, we're available for at least a little bit of time when you're awake and, um, and we're ready to talk whenever you are. Exactly. Um, and so actually just to, you know, under the resources section, there's, I mean, there's also an FAQ area here. Um, you know, what occurred to me as I saw some of those first questions come in, we throw out acronyms like crazy. Oh my gosh. We just throw them out there. We're like MLC, HFA, DSP, you know, we just CMO, um, the acronyms that we use so many of them in the industry. And if this is new to you, um, you're probably, this is like an alphabet soup. What are they talking about? So if you want to check out our FAQs, um, most of those acronyms that we, uh, we use all the time, you can find them actually defined in the FAQs so that you can, uh, you can, and learn the lingo if this is kind of new to you. All right, All right. so I'm going to come out of screen share. There we go. And kick it back to you. Lacey, are we ready? Great. We are done. So I will actually go ahead and share my screen. So you... Um, hopefully can now see an overview of, um, well, let me refresh it so that you can see an overview. There we go. We have 33 participants. We had 43 thoughts and 256 ratings. And just to cover um, uh, our breakdown. So it looks like we have mostly fully self-administered songwriters um, in the group today. We have a few partially self-administered songwriters and um, some other folks joining us. It does look like that um, our group is somewhat familiar with mechanical licensing. Um, we have a small percentage who is it's relatively new too, so welcome. And we have um, a group that's um, very familiar. So I will um, then show, we can show a word cloud as to um, kind of, here's a, a good idea so you can see what um, came forward um, uh, in the questions today. Um, and then we can actually jump into the thoughts if that sounds great. Yep. Awesome. 
So this is all compiled real time. Uh, there's there's no filter. Um, it is what you asked. Yes. So as you can see, I guess the the most um, most questions were related to getting paid and payments. Um, so we will actually kind of go down the list here and address um, the top questions in each category and, and get to as many um, as we can. So I will go ahead and, and share the screen while um, Chris and Serona answer these questions. Thanks, Lacey. All right, do we search and collect for past lost royalties? So um, many of you have probably heard that back in February, we received $424 million in historical royalties. Um, the law, the MMA um, that created the MLC gave digital services the opportunity to transfer all of their remaining unmatched royalties that accrued for uses before January this year to the MLC. Um, and in exchange for that, they got a waiver of liability um, that meant that they couldn't be sued for those failures to pay. Um, that is the, the, the primary and really only mechanism that we have for going back and searching and collecting for past royalties. But because of the, the sort of uh, trade in the law, um, the DSPs, were they to not have paid any of those historical royalties, they would not be eligible for that protection. So um, we certainly believe, and the law was intended to ensure that that um, mechanism um, encourage the transfer of all of the remaining historical unmatched royalties that are out there. Um, 20 DSPs paid us uh, unmatched historical royalties. And if you go to our website, to the How It Works section, under historical unmatched royalties, you can see a, a chart that shows each DSP and the total they paid. And then you can click on their name and you can actually see the breakdown of those historical unmatched royalties that they've paid us by offering, service offering, and then by month. So you can see exactly how much in total by offering they paid us um, going back as far back as they paid us. Uh, we are still waiting for those services. Uh, they have until June 15th to provide us with some additional data that we will need in order to process and pay it. So we have not yet begun to pay out that money. We don't have all of the data needed to do that, um, but we expect that we'll do that um, certainly before the end of this year, we'll begin to um, match and pay out those monies and make it available in the portal so that you can all see it and look through it yourselves. So I think that answered the first question and it may have answered the, the second, second one. one. Yeah. Yes, that money relates to uses of your songs or uses of songs that took place prior to January, 2021. And it goes back in time as long as the DSP was operating its service. So in I think a couple of instances, the data goes back or suggests that the royalties that were transferred to us go back as far as 2010, in one case, even 2007. That said, I will tell you, and you'll be able to see this yourself, most of the data, all but 50 million of it, actually relates to royalties that were um, uh, uh, attributable to uses that took place in the last three years. So if you think about it, streaming has really grown dramatically in the last three to five years. Um, and, and most of the unmatched activity reflects that period when streaming really became the dominant form of distribution, uh, digital distribution for music. So if you go back to 2010, you will see relatively small amounts, which reflects in part the fact that in 2010, streaming was really, really small at that moment in time. Downloads were still the, the largest um, form of distribution if they were even the dominant form. It could be back in 2010, if I remember correctly, that CDs were still the dominant form of distribution. So again, you can see more information on our website, but that covers the first two questions. I can knock first out question. some of these other ones um, kind of quickly, because I know we've got we've got a lot of categories. Please, um, Serona. Yes, I was gonna hand sure. off to you the next one. Awesome, yeah, absolutely. So do we pay each individual writer or publisher or does the label do that when they are paid? So firstly, let me make clear, we do not pay labels, right? We are paying mechanical royalties to parties on the song side of the business, not on the recording side of the business. And so we pay whichever party it is who's entitled to collect mechanical royalties from a licensee. And so often that is a music publisher or a publishing administrator, but it is also often a self-administered songwriter, which many of you are. So if you are a songwriter and you have some works that are handled by a publisher or a publishing administrator, for those works, we're going to pay the publisher or the administrator, and then they will pay you. 
But if you have works that you administer, right? So you are basically acting as the publisher for those works, then we will be paying you directly, not because you're a writer, but because you're acting like your own publisher. So that's how that works. Um, and I'm just going to keep going because, you know, I want to be conscious of time and get to as many as we can. Um, do unpaid mechanicals earn interest while they're being held? Yes, they do. The Music Modernization Act requires that there is interest being held on unpaid royalties. Um, and so, yes, not only will there be interest being earned, we will be paying that out to you um, if those royalties are not able to be paid to you as soon as they are available to be paid. Um, so yes, well, that's something we're very excited about. All right, let's jump into the next one. Let's see, Chris, you may want to tackle the first one or two on this one. Let's see. Yeah, this one is a great one. If I own a percentage of publishing shares with co-writers, should I include their publishing information when I register a work or only my own? So if you administer the shares of those co-writers for them, and let's say you collect all of your shares, yours and theirs, um, through an entity that you've set up, like My Band Publishing, then you can set up their shares um, under that publishing entity that you've created for you and your co-writers slash bandmates. If, however, you uh, don't collect for them, they collect money themselves or through some other entity, then you can't set up their data. You can only set up your own data. The reason for that is we believe that the, the best source of data about um, the, the people entitled to receive mechanicals for any song are the folks entitled to receive the mechanicals for that song. So in that instance, we don't want to make the assumption that just because you co-wrote a song with three other people, that you may have no connection with other than the fact that you sat in a room one day and wrote the song with them, or you never sat in a room with them, you just traded kind of pieces of the song um, with a producer over email. We don't want to assume that you have the right to speak authoritatively for them. So again, if you are managing those shares together and collecting them through a single entity or single payment point, you can. Um, but if you are not doing that, then you would only register your own share. If you have more questions about that, please call support and talk it through with one of our associates. Um, next one, um, I can speak to this too. I've uploaded uh, data over a month ago, but I haven't had any songs cleared. How long should I wait or is there a problem that I don't know about? So first of all, anytime you're wondering what's going on, you should contact our support team. Don't sit and wait and wonder. That said, this question we get quite a long time. And the third question kind of uh, speaks to the same thing. How long does it take for songs to get approved by the MLC? Well, not surprisingly, perhaps there is no single answer to that question because the circumstances of every registration can vary. And we tend to look at each thing um, differently depending on those circumstances. That said, what I can tell you is that um, since we've launched the, um, the portal with the registration mechanisms right before the end of the year, um, more than 70% of the works that are submitted to us um, get fully processed within a week and 80% are processed within three weeks. So the answer is most of the time things get processed pretty quickly. And for those that don't, um, again, uh, definitely worth checking with our support team. That's always the best way to um, find out what's happening. And I will tell you too, you know, everything we built is, is um, in this respect is brand new. So there will occasionally be issues where something you thought you submitted, it turns out you didn't, it didn't connect for us for whatever reason. Maybe there was a technical issue on our end, on your end. Um, but that's another reason to follow up with support because we've definitely had situations where someone said, well, I submitted that a month ago and they may have tried to submit it, but we don't see any record on our end. And it's very hard at that point to know what happened. Did their browser have a problem? Did they think they had submit and did it not work for some reason? Um, maybe there was a glitch on our end, right? We're trying to make the system better. We know it's not perfect out of the gate. So calling is the best way to be sure. We don't want you to wait a month and then find out that something happened and that registration never got there. And, uh, and now you're starting again a month later. Uh, Fourth one kind of relates to this. I'm happy to take yeah, a quick look. A lot of these are all, this is, this is why we love thought exchange because <clears throat> we can look, gr group these things by theme and really kind of tackle what's on a lot of your minds. So absolutely. Yes. So not clear on your submit process, pending system for registered works. Um, 
that is a first attempt to try to help you understand where things are in the process. We are now learning that we can provide more information about that. We've um, been talking about how we could show the date when the work is officially registered so that you can really see um, whether or not it got into our data set before that monthly cutoff date um, that usually happens 10 months after the month for which the usage took place. 10, <laughs> ten, ten days. 10 days, I'm sorry, 10 <laughs> days, 10 days. Um, so we're gonna try to add more to that um, to help explain better what the status is. But in short, that's meant to try to show you where in the process things are, that dashboard of categories and colors. Um, do you wanna take the next one, Serona, the old project involving a co-writer? Sure, sure. So the way it works with the MLC, it's a little different than I, I know than it works with some of the performing rights organizations. Um, but Chris, you did kind of tackle this. You are only going to register the share that you administer. So it's okay that you have not been in touch with them. You need to register your share. Um, now there is a songwriter field in there where we would love for you to tell us their name, right? Fill in all the writer names that you know of. And in this example, it would be that old um, co-writer you haven't talked to in a while, um, but you are only gonna register your share of the work and you'll be able to get paid for your share of the work, even if you know, you're never able to find them and persuade them to register the other portion of the work. So please, um, Try and reach out, let them know, because they could be missing out on money. But um, if you're not able to get through to them or get them to take any action, that's okay. You take the action you need, play your part, and you'll get paid. Yep. Okay. Um, I think I touched on the second one again. Um, registered quite a few songs. Don't see them yet. Um, it's not instantaneous by any means. We, we do a lot of vetting behind the scenes because we ultimately want to make sure that um, you know, you're registering things properly and registering things you should be registering. And we don't want someone to register something of yours that they shouldn't. So um, it's not immediate. But again, um, you know, within a week, um, in the last three months, 70% of things are processed, which means they should show up in the portal shortly thereafter. Within three weeks, we're processing 80%. And, um, and for the rest, it may take a little longer. So that's why you should check support and see what happens. Um, what happens if the song claim is over 100%? So this is a great question. Today, you are not able to register a share if 100% has been claimed, but you can call support and say, I'm trying to register a share of a work that's already 100% claimed. And you can essentially then um, file a dispute because if, if you still have a share to claim, but others have claimed 100%, then that means that someone else has claimed more than they should have, which means you're now in a dispute with someone else among those registrants. So contact our support team. Um, in the coming months, we're going to um, enhance the functionality of the portal to allow you to submit those shares, even if it's at 100%, and that will initiate the dispute process automatically in the portal. There are lots of ways that we can make that process better, more streamlined, and in many respects automated. But for now, if you find that, don't worry, contact support, let them know what happened, and they'll be able to help you register um, what essentially is a claim that then triggers a dispute. And if you're wondering how the dispute process works, again, you can go to the dispute policy on our website that Serona pointed out earlier. Do you want to take so, the next um, one, Serona? Well, yeah, there's actually two questions that were similar about um, identifiers. Um, and so, so let me say this. You do not have to have any of the different industry identifiers in order to register a work with us. Okay. So that's, that's not a barrier that you can do this, even if you don't know the identifiers, but it is fantastic for you to add them to the data because it helps us connect recordings and usage of recordings of your works with your works, which helps us pay you. Um, and so, um, you know, the, we have the fields to put the identifiers in, right? So for writers and publishers, you might have an IP. Um, and you would have gotten that when you first signed up with the performing rights organization, they assign songwriters and publishers IPIs. That's the identifier for a writer or a publisher. You might have the ISWC for your musical works. That's a unique identifier for musical works. That's also assigned by a performing rights organization. Um, and the ISRCs, probably my favorite data attribute 
And most important for matching sound recordings to musical works is if you know the ISRC, that's the unique identifier assigned to recordings. And so when you are setting up your musical works in the database, there is a place where you can add in the identifiers, the, the name of the artist and the identifier for the recordings of recordings that have been made of your musical works. If you know that information, that is like, we're getting close to data nirvana, right? You put in that ISRC and associate that with your musical work. And that is probably one of the biggest data identifier things you can do to help you get paid. So none of those are required, but the more, the better. Okay. All right, Chris, um, let's see. i um, keeping track of time. Um, are there any others in this category you want to hit quickly before we check out some other categories? Um, I just answered one question in the chat about the ASCAP identifiers. We don't use proprietary identifiers for other companies. We use these international identifiers that are used by all um, organizations like us. They might have um, been meaning those, actually. I mean, I, I would, from doing a lot of these webinars, I would, I wouldn't be shocked if that's what they meant by ASCAP identifiers was the IPI and the ISWC. Um, agreed. That's, and, yeah, that's yep. awesome. So those yeah. we do use. <laughs> So um, you made a mistake in the submission process and you can't edit it yet. That may be because the work is still being processed on our end. Um, if you run into that problem, call support. Certainly um, we can pull that um, submission back on our end and um, help you then get set up to submit again. Um, and that might be quicker than waiting for that to go through and then editing it, at which point you have to then wait for the edit to be processed. So again, in that situation, call support. What if you... Um, what do you do if you see a claim on your song that you're not familiar with? Uh, that's another uh, great situation for calling support. Um, one of the things that has come up from time to time is people will see um, something on a registration for a song they've written and they don't recognize it. And there can be lots of explanations for that. Again, data has been a real challenge to manager industry for a long time. So there could just be a mistake um, in that existing data that you're seeing that you want to correct. Sometimes, and this is actually more common than you might think, because rights are represented differently around the world, right? There may be a songwriter who self-administers here, but they, they work with an administrator outside the US or they might even have a sub-publisher outside the US. Sometimes that sub-publisher for the ex-US rights may mistakenly register their, their shares of a work with an organization like HFA, and they put worldwide instead of XUS. And, and now that organization is listed as the registrant for us in the US um, for that work. They didn't do that um, intentionally. They just filled out a form wrong on their end, trying to collect um, and register the work properly for you outside the US or one of your co-writers. So there are lots of scenarios like that. Um, but again, the, the point in all this is you now have a really easy, clear way to see those issues, to bring them to our attention, and then to work with us to get them corrected. We won't necessarily know that your sub-publisher overseas doesn't have US rights. No way we would know that. Um, but if you bring it to our attention, then we can contact them and quickly work that out. And that's often what happens. Um, we have seen that numerous times where when someone um, contacts us, we then contact the other party and they're like, oh, that was my bad. So again, transparency means that you see the state of the data in whatever state it's in. And it's not so much about whether it's perfect now, it's about whether through your review and our help, we can make it perfect. And that's what our process enables you to do. Um, most efficient way to tackle ensuring all of your titles are correct. So again, if you self-administer or self-publish some of your works, become a member and, um, and then start registering those. For your published works or your administered works where they're administered by someone else, you can still look at the data. And if you see an issue, then contact your publisher or administrator. That's really common for folks that have publishers. And it's also common for, for you know, artists and writers who um, do it all themselves for part of the time. Some folks may be working with a company like TuneCore or CD Baby Pro, um, or they are connected to Song Trust for some of their songs. All those companies offer publishing administration. But if you haven't given them all of your sound recordings, um, you may still be self-administering for some of your songs. So again, there's no one size fits all solution for you as a creator. We know that. Um, so we're flexible. We can work with you or your partners in whatever way you set it up. 
But the bottom line is if you self-publish any song of yours, you can become a member and you should become a member for that song or those songs so that we can pay you directly. And then we will also pay your administrator or your publisher for songs that they are managing for you. Um, as a self-published artist, is there a recommended percentage to put down in the pub box? Well, again, this is, this is um, not a kind of a choice question so much as a question of reality. So if you wrote your own song entirely and you are the 100% owner of that song, then the percentage you should put when you register that work with us is 100%. But let's say Serona and I wrote a song together and we agree that we're each co-owners, we contributed equally to that song. And we've decided that Serona's entitled to 50% of the mechanicals as a result, and I'm entitled to 50%. You should then register your work and claim 50%. And again, Serona is responsible for registering her 50%. So when you register, you just put your 50 and that's it. You can let her know, say, hey, pal, I just registered my half. Make sure you register yours, be a good friend, but don't worry about their half. They're responsible for their half. If you wrote with three other people, the answer might be a third, a third, a third. What's great about songwriters is often songwriters are pretty um, uh, equitable in the way they divide things. Um, so you should claim the share that you have collectively agreed with your co-writers you're entitled to receive. Um, again, sometimes that gets complicated because on some songs, especially songs um, in the pop genres, you can see 10 or 15 songwriters and often the percentages quite, get quite small. You may not all, all have sat in a room together. Maybe you contributed a little bit here and someone else then kind of assembled the pieces. Um, that's where it gets tricky. So the best thing you can do is communicate with the other writers on the song. If there was a writer producer who put all the pieces together, reach out to them. Um, but again, you can always register what you think is your share. And then if it turns out that the shares add up to more than 100, then we will ultimately be in a position where if one of you brings that to our attention, we'll put the work on hold via the dispute process and that will help you all to work it out, right? If we know there's a dispute and we don't know which shares it involves, we're gonna put all the shares on hold until you work it out. That way no one gets paid until all of you agree on how much each of you should get paid. Um, good question from a bandmate. So again, this is an example where you as the representative of the band, you can now register uh, those shares. You could do it for all of them through one payee, one member. That could be you as an individual, though probably for tax purposes, it might be better in that case to set it up as an entity like an LLC. That way you're not paying income tax on the band's uh, earnings only to then hand them their share and maybe have them not pay taxes. Um, but again, that's a good question for your accountant or someone in your life that knows a little bit more about tax issues. Uh, if you set up an LLC, then you can register all the shares um, for them and you can list each of the writers in that case. If each of you wants to have your shares represented individually, um, then you can set up individual publishing entities or individual DBAs or yourselves and you can each then have those shares paid to you directly. So it depends on how you as a band want that revenue to flow to you. Do you want it to arrive all together in one payment that you then divide up on your end? Or do you each want to get your shares individually um, and get separate checks and separate statements from us? If you have questions about that, that's another great thing to, to talk through with our support team. So I see some thanks. Um, <laughs> if you have to leave, that's okay. Yeah. We're going to stay on a little longer, but hopefully you found this helpful. And again, we're doing these every month. So if you didn't get all your questions answered, or if you want to know what questions people are asking next month, join us again next month. You can attend as much as you want. We do these every month. And our goal is to be here um, as often as possible to answer as many questions for you as you can. We can. Serona. Um, so actually, I just wanted to do a quick plug as well for some of you guys. I see some questions in the chat and here and there that are really, they're much bigger than mechanical licensing questions. And really what I want to just encourage you to do is, you know, think about joining a songwriter organization out there. There's a variety of them. And, you know, they are, they are there specifically to help educate songwriters and advocate for songwriters. And so, um, so, you know, 
in my mind, in Chris's mind, we want you to know everything there is to know so that you get paid. But I know this industry is complicated <laughs> um, and it can take some time to wade through it. So please do consider um, songwriter organizations who might be able to help get you answers to all those other broader questions. Okay, so no. let me try and answer this one um, quickly. I know my screen is so small. All right, so um, many songwriters I know give me a blank stare. <laughs> Um, how can I help get the word out? All right. Such a great question. You know, it's a combination of doing all the same things we do. Word of mouth, social media, um, have a webinar watching party. You know, when life gets back to normal, invite them over, you know, have some popcorn and drinks and be like, let's all watch this webinar together. And then those of you who might understand some of this a little better than others could have your own kind of, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, help coach them through it. Bring a laptop. You can help them all register their works together. So, you know, maybe we'll encourage MLC parties when people start partying again. Again. Um, but really just tell them about it, repost our posts. You know, you can repost everything. We're on all the social platforms. So you can repost that on your, on your own socials. Um, you can see our webinar schedule and again, you know, have them, have them join you uh, virtually or in person for the, for the webinars. And, you know, I'll just last thing, cause I know we're, we're so tight on time. Um, we did a webinar recently about data and, you know, and I said this a little jokingly at the beginning, cause I know data can be a kind of dry topic. Um, my slide said, friends don't let friends miss out on royalties because of bad musical works data. So um, I am pleased to hear you even asking this question. It means you're a really good friend and, um, and thank you for that. So yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> At the risk of, uh, of, of keeping us long, I do want to say we have done now, I think more than 175 webinars since last May. We are approaching 20,000 attendees. We have um, thousands of followers across our social media uh, channels. We distribute uh, two newsletters monthly, a member newsletter, which if you haven't signed up for, I'd encourage you to do so, and then a general newsletter. Between those two newsletters, we are reaching more than 18,000 people a month. We have begun running ads on industry sites um, uh, that we think um, will, uh, will be places that songwriters um, check out um, you know, for information about the industry. And then as the world opens up again, we're going to begin doing live events. Right now, our chief marketing officer is down in Key West at the Key West Songwriters Festival, which is, I think, the first festival to have relaunched in person since the pandemic began. So we have been out in the world a ton. We have done a ton. There are lots of ways to connect with us, but there are many more people still to connect with. So all of this is about spreading the word and you can help do that um, yourself, and we would love for you to do that. Check out the chat. There are some social media graphics you can pick up. Um, <clears throat> I just saw the bottom one. I is it possible to double dip being signed up with too many platforms? Uh, no, it should not be possible to double dip. Um, because again, you know, we only collect 100% of the royalties for a given song, and um, we match one song to one sound recording. Um, not two, two, two songs to one sound recording. We may match one sound recording or multiple sound recordings to the same work, because if you're lucky enough to have your work covered, there could be lots of sound recordings out there. But no, double dipping should not be your worry. Your worry should be leaving behind revenue that you didn't know you were earning. So again, that digital royalties chart is a great resource to see um, some of the different ways you can be paid as a self-administered creator. And you want to make sure you're getting paid by all of those folks. What I would just say is sort of a related thing is you also don't want to create a rights conflict when there isn't one. So let's say, for example, you're a writer and you've signed up with one of those. There's a couple of publishing administration services out there. They will register your works. You don't want to also register your works because then we're going to sit here and go, Timmy songwriter says this is his. And a song trust says this is theirs and the money's going to go on hold until we can figure out who actually is the right party to be registering that work. So don't worry about double dipping, but do find out if you are working with a company that is going to be collecting on your behalf. You don't want to also try to collect directly or you might throw that work into a, a conflict status, which can be easily resolved, but it just might create a delay. So I just want to throw that in there. That's a great point, Srona. This top question is a good one. So when I use the wizard, I'm not finding a place to enter percentages for writers. So again, remember that what you're registering is your share of the mechanicals for that work. 
So when you register your share, the only percentage you need to put in is the percentage that you are entitled to collect through your member profile. You could be the member individually, or you could have an entity that you've set up to be the member. That's why you can't plug in the percentages for the other writers. You can put their names in initially, but all you're doing is ultimately saying, I, as a member, represent this percent of the works for the one or more writers you represent. So again, when you're registering, we're, we don't need you to say, oh, I get 50% and Serona gets 50%, or I get 25, Serona gets 25, Lacey gets 25, and Kaylee gets 25. All you need to tell us is that you, through your member profile, are entitled to 25%. And then it's up to Serona, Kaylee, and Lacey to put in their 25%. And again, I get, for some of you, you're like, well, that's silly. I know their information. Why can't I put it in there? Trust me when I tell you, for every band where it's all harmonious and everyone loves each other and it's like, we're all good, I trust you, Serona, there are other bands or other co-writers for whom that doesn't exist. And they're not on such friendly terms. And again, we don't know the answer. We don't know if you're all pals and you all trust each other or if you haven't talked for 20 years, but you make a lot of money on a really great song you wrote 20 years ago. So we depend on each rights holder to submit their share. And if you want to do it together, you can set up you can set up an LLC to represent all of you, just like I said with the earlier um, question. And then you can make that LLC the member for all of you as co-writers and bandmates. And then on your end, you can divide up the money however you'd like. Lots of very successful bands who also write music, they do that. They set up an LLC for the band, and that LLC collects their artist royalties, their songwriting royalties, and then they distribute that behind the scenes in ways that only they know. That's also a great way to maintain privacy. Hey, Danny Chow, thanks for joining us too. All right, are there a couple others here that we can uh, peg off, pick off quickly? We can stay a little bit longer, Serona. Great question. So do we do the same thing as CD Baby? No. CD Baby um, is a company that represents you as a self-administered person who wants help getting your music, your sound recordings onto the services. And if you sign up for a service like CD Baby Pro to collect your publishing royalties for those songs. So they can be a member. They are in fact, a member of the MLC, just like publishers are members of the MLC. That goes for Song Trust and TuneCore and a host of other companies. I think SoundCloud has reposts. All of those companies are members, just like you. DistroKid, to my knowledge, does not have a publishing admin service, Jimmy. So DistroKid only represents your sound recording interests. And if you're with DistroKid, that means you need to solve for publishing or you will not get paid your mechanicals. HFA is like us and was like us. They did what we do um, before January 1st, but now under the blanket license, the MLC is the exclusive administrator of the digital audio mechanical royalties that are paid under the blanket. HFA still administers other rights. So you might still get paid from HFA, for um, lyric rights or video rights, or even for digital audio mechanicals, if you maintained a direct or voluntary license with a digital service, that's possible. Music Reports also, like HFA, provides administrative services in other areas, and they can also administer those voluntary licenses. So it doesn't mean now that HFA does not pay you, but the blanket royalties that we collect only come through us. So if you need to get those and you are self-administering, you should become a member of us. If you signed up for CD Baby Pro, then they're going to take care of collecting those royalties from us and get them to your account so that you don't have to do that. Uh, what is a DSP? Serona, once again. Digital Service Provider. Yeah, this is one of those acronyms. And to the second question, yes, we're talking about Spotify, for example, um, Amazon Music, Apple Music. But a really critical thing here is to understand that not every digital service out there needs a mechanical license. And so um, there's only, you know, you guys, it's like inside baseball, right? You guys are like inside the music industry. You have to learn that not all streaming is equal. And so we're talking about interactive 
exclusive audio streaming. So you get to go and control what you listen to and you're listening to the audio. That's separate from watching a video and that's different from a non-interactive stream, which is more like internet or satellite radio. And so all those different kinds of streams, those are three different examples um, where they're not the same and the rights are different and the licensing model is different. The revenue flow is different. So what we're talking about are interactive streams and downloads of audio um, in the United States. Um, so yeah. And if you're wondering who those DSPs are, you can go to our website under how it works. There's a DSP notices page. You can see listed all of the DSPs that have sent us notices. A DSP that submitted a notice of license is a DSP that will be paying us royalties. Um, and if you go to the portal, to your member account, on that first statement page, you can actually click for each month. Right now, it's only for January because um, our first distribution covered January. That's the only one that we've done. But you can see a list of all of the DSPs who paid us royalties that we then included in that month's distribution. So for the, the first distribution in April that included usage data from January, we included royalties. We distributed royalties to you as members from as many as 36 different DSPs. There are some really big ones and there are no doubt some small ones that you may not have known existed, but you can find all of that information on our website, on the public section or in the statement section by clicking on that, um, that uh, link that brings you to the DSP uh, or blanket licensee distribution status report. It's a single sheet of paper that shows all the DSPs and whether they were in the distribution or not for um, that particular period, that particular distribution. Lacey, um, have we gotten through most everything or we got one more? Let's take one more. Uh, are aggregators payola for streaming platforms? Um, that's uh, a really uh, tough question and one that I'm not in a position to answer. Aggregators provide a really important service. They help connect you to the market. Sorona, I will speak for myself and say, I am old enough that as a musician, when I was making records, um, I had no way to get my music into a record store. There was simply no way to access it. So today, these aggregators, some of which we've mentioned, they give any musician in the world the ability to access the largest digital marketplaces in the world globally. That is phenomenal. How they then help get things on playlists is a different story. That's more of a marketing question. There are lots of legitimate ways that people, companies can help get your music on playlists, which helps increase the number of people who see it. Um, certainly, if there are things happening that are legal, um, then there are authorities looking out for that. Um, the extent to which that is happening or not is not something that I have knowledge on firsthand, so I'm not going to comment on it. And Daniel Eck, not going to say anything about that other than I did meet him once, seemed like a nice guy. Um, I think he's passionate about music, which is why there are companies in the music business um, and not in the music plus a lot of other stuff business. But again, he can speak for himself. Um, that is way above my, uh, my level. I'll tackle the second one. And then if you want to tackle the third one, so yes. the second one you kind of answered, and I'm going to just break it down like even more, even more so. So understand there are companies that have been around a long time that did digital distribution of sound recordings, right? They did exactly what Chris was just saying. They provided a way for self-released recording artists to get their recordings on digital services. Those companies, a lot of them have been doing this for quite some time. Some of them, some of them, not all of them, have added a second set of services that they can provide that you could opt into or maybe not. So they've grown what they offer to add publishing administration services, right? And so you now, as a self-administered songwriter and self-released artist, you can decide, generally speaking, if you want to use one of those companies just for digital distribution of your sound recordings, or if you also want to have them handle your publishing administration. And if the answer is yes to that, then you are no longer self-administered. They are your administrator, okay? And so it's really important to kind of understand that. So the money that TuneCore collects for you as the recording office, Serona, you froze. I'm going to pick up where Serona left off in the hope that I didn't freeze. The money that TuneCore collects for you on the recording Artists side for those okay. uh, is Go different Sorry. than the money that they could collect if you elected to have them do it on the publishing side. So again, as a self-administered songwriter and performer, you run your own business. 
you're entitled to all those revenue streams and you wanna make sure you get paid for all of them, the sound recording side revenue streams and the song side revenue streams for the songs that you wrote. I will say, if you covered a hit song, if you did a, a covered a song that was you know, originally written by the two guys from the Stones, don't claim to have written that. You're just taking a little bit of money away from them. They're icons, they deserve it. We want them to get paid right too. So for covers, don't list yourself as the writer. Um, but if it's your song, you wrote it, then it's yours, you're entitled to the revenue. And again, in those instances where you, you use TuneCore or one of those other services, make sure you're clear on whether they are collecting your sound recording royalties only or your sound record, recording royalties and your publishing royalties. Um, I think I'm going to tackle this last one, Serona. Go and for it. And am it I up. back? Am I back? You are back. Okay. All You're right. Back. But go for it. This one's all so, you. Why was the MLC created? We could probably do a whole separate panel on this. But in short, the MLC was created by Congress because rights holders like you and the great advocacy organizations that represent you recognize that many, many, many of you were not getting paid properly when your works were streamed on these digital streaming services. And that problem begged a new solution. The way that the system worked before was not sustainable. Essentially, digital services were obligated to try to find each writer of each song and license those works on a work by work basis and then figure out how to pay you. Some of the largest digital services have more than 70 million sound recordings on them and probably tens of millions of works. So all of the rights holders decided that it would be better, far better if there was an organization created that sat in the middle of that process and such that all of the services had to pay all their money and all their data had to go to that one place. And if that company rep uh, represented all the interests of rights holders, maintained a single database, one place where if you update your data there, you know that you would get paid properly for all of the streaming activity of your songs on any of those streaming services that operate under the blanket and some of the download services that now operate under the blanket too, that that would be a far better system that stood a better chance of making sure you got paid properly. And again, just to throw it in for good measure, if the digital services could pay for that organization, even though that organization is then governed by you, the rights holders, our board consists entirely of music publishers, small and large, and self-administered songwriters. If the digital services could pay the bill, but we were managed by all of you, your representatives, that would be a better solution. So that's why the MLC was created. We are a nonprofit organization. Our sole job is to make sure you get paid 100% of what you do. As you can tell, that's what makes us excited. We are passionate about that. And that's what everyone on our team is passionate about doing, is supporting you and making sure you get paid properly. We don't make a profit. We do this to support you. So that's why the MLC was created. And um, we remain available and excited to serve you every day. So thanks for joining us today. This is one way that we can serve you. Thanks so much for um, being engaged in the process. Please spread the word, stay involved. And if you have any questions at all, contact our support team, we're here to help. Until next time, Serona, thanks for being here. Happy to be your sidekick, Chris, always happy. And thank you all for joining us from all over the country and several places around the world. We'll see you soon, be safe.